What's up, beautiful ladies and handsome men? I am not sure what's true or false in this story. I take gossip, tea, rumor, and scandal from yesteryear, from online, from word of mouth, from books, and I ball it up and I tell you guys a story. Now, let's get to it. Bam! Have y'all signed up for your Skillshare classes yet? That's all I need to know. Has anybody signed up for their Skillshare classes yet? But Ashley, I need to be able to see some success stories where it worked for somebody. Check out my Instagram, boo. Check out my YouTube Reels, boo. Now I know they haven't been perfected, but y'all cannot tell me that my media presence on Instagram and YouTube Reels has not grown. And that's because I consistently work on myself with Skillshare. If you guys have been watching me for a minute, which most of y'all have, then you already know that Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of creative and inspiring classes for people who love to learn. Baby, they offer some of everything. But me, myself, the class that I keep coming back to for Instagram and short videos is video for Instagram, tell an engaging story in less than one minute. Taught by the incredible teacher, Halise Narvaez. She and other Skillshare teachers are so freaking engaging, and at this point, I'm ready to send baby girl a thank you note. Because like I said, my reels are not perfection, but shoot, at least I'm stepping out there. If I said it once, I'll say it a million times. Keep on sitting back and let your dreams pass you by just because you don't really know how to do this or that. Because see, now it ain't no excuse. Especially with me offering yet another discount to the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link below and get their first one month free of Skillshare. Go ahead and click the link and start exploring your creativity today. It does not hurt to try, guys. Now, baby, before we start this story, this is a trigger warning for your behind, honey. I wouldn't even recommend you watch this video if you have any triggers when it comes to any abuse. If you insist on staying to watch the video, put your helmet on, strap it up, and baby, get your flashlight ready as well because we are are about to do a deep dive on the scandalous, very, very messy Woody Allen. Let's get to it. Oh, and I nor you have time to be here all night, so when it comes to Woody Allen's background or biography, we're gonna skim on through that really quickly because we got a lot of scandal to break down. Allen Stewart Konigsberg was born on November 30th, 1935 in New York City. His mother's name was Nettie, a bookkeeper, and his father's name was Marvin, a jewelry engraver and waiter. Now the folks say that Nettie was a very difficult woman. They say she abused her family and she certainly wore the pants in her household. It's a alleged that Woody as well as his younger sister had to suffer through terrible family fight. And because his father and his mother couldn't really get along or get a handle on things, soon they separated. After the split, Woody became estranged from his mother because whenever he was around her, there was the threat of violence and also she tried to control him. She was a very authoritarian type woman. Now, as Woody went through school age, most people feel like he should have been a bookworm or you know, he was very smart. Baby, they said that that was definitely not the case. I don't know if he was necessarily dumb, but he was not just like some top tier kid. However, his arm was top tier when it came to baseball. They said that he was an incredible pitcher. Now, as far as creativity, Woody showed promise at a very early age. While he was still a teenager, he wrote comics and they were sold to a local newspaper. Baby, Woody was making so much money and was in such high demand that by the time he graduated high school, which was in about 1952, 1953, uh, this boy was making more than his parents were making. He intended to keep this comic right up and also go to college, but unfortunately he flunked out of college terribly. However, that did not matter much because he would indeed still find success with his comic writing. By age 19, he was invited to join NBC's writer development program. He was soon writing scripts for The Ed Sullivan Show, The Tonight Show, and many more. Now by 1960, somebody had the bright idea that Woody Allen should become a comedian. Since he was already writing the jokes, why not be the one to tell the joke? Now at first Woody was like, nah, I don't want to do that, but this person kept pushing him and so Woody was like well okay I'm not gonna do comedy and film so I'll just become a stand-up comedian and so Woody started to hit the stage at several small clubs but then he found out that his audience were also stand-up comedians when he would come to the stage they would stand up and walk out just kidding I don't know if these people actually walked out but it was definitely recorded that they did not like the show and it was just because his style was just not cutting it at that time see unlike me and I'm not a comedian even though y'all feel like I am but what I am is very expensive Expressive. You know what I'm saying? I act things out. You know, I'm all over the place, baby. Well, Woody was more of the Dave Chappelle type. He was more of the walk on stage, cool, calm, and collected, and 
basically talk to his audience with a straight face and in a calm voice, like he was just having a conversation with one of his closest friends. I mean, this was 1960 and just a few years before, slapstick comedy or fall down type comedy was all the rage. And so when Woody hit the stage just being very calm, you know, folks didn't know what was going on and they did not appreciate the humor at all. But per gossip, Woody stood firm in his type of comedy and eventually the audience started to come around. And before long, Woody started to shoot up in the popularity rank. He started to appear on big talk shows. He even had his own comedy special. But while Woody was becoming this uh, big comedian and this comedic genius, he also started writing stage plays as well as screenplays. And over time, these became his main interest. And his stage plays did okay. I mean, they were not super successful, but you know, they did something with one of them named Play It Again Sam getting at least 453 runs. In fact, in the later years, Play It Again Sam actually became a movie. And although it was not that movie per se, it was movies that would propel Woody Allen into the annals of history. His two earliest standouts was a movie named Annie Hall, which was released in 1977, and a movie called Manhattan that was released in 1979. These movies were so successful, people just started to look forward to Woody Allen coming out with a new movie every single year. He was a highly anticipated hot as a firecracker director. And not only that, he was not too bad of an actor because Woody Allen liked to appear in a lot of his own film. So since the request for Woody Allen was becoming so huge, this guy obliged the public. He obliged his audience and he kept releasing movie after movie. And he was quickly on his way to becoming a legend in his own lifetime. Heck, really, some people still feel like Woody Allen is a legend in his own lifetime. But that amount of people could have been much more if Woody Allen had not had one of the biggest scandals known to mankind. And we are about to get into that scandal as well as others right now. Now, although I didn't mention this in the beginning bio, Woody Allen has been married three times and at least two of his marriages were marred in scandal. His first marriage to Harlene Rosen when he was 20 and she was 17 was one of those marriages. It really seems like this was a young and misguided marriage, but it lasted three years. And during those three years, Woody Allen would use Harlene as the butt of his joke. And a lot of comedians have done this as well, with uh, Kevin Hart being one of the most recent. Well, you know, I don't know if Kevin Hart actually uses Eniko as the butt of his jokes, but his ex-wife Tori Hart, he definitely used to use her in his jokes. So it was not necessarily unheard of, but Woody Allen messed around and took it too far. In fact, it was way too far because when he made the offending joke that he made, he and Harlene weren't even uh, married anymore. Now listen at this. Sometime in 1959, Woody and Harlene divorced. Well, when Harlene was returning to her own apartment one night, uh, she was sexually assaulted. Well, apparently when Woody heard about this, he was right in the middle of writing new material and felt like this would be like a class joke. Baby, would it bean shaped skippy head to tail hit several stages? Okay guys, well the newspaper has been talking about how my ex-wife was violated. Well, knowing her, it certainly was not a moving violation. Huh? Huh? And y'all might be looking at me like I'm crazy and not laughing, but Woody's audience were eating it up, honey, them folks was on the floor rolling laughing. But still, Woody's ex-wife Harlene is absolutely mortified. And so Harlene tells Woody, stop doing this. Stop using what happened to me as a joke. But Woody basically kept hitting stages and kept saying the same joke. So since he does not shut his mouth, Harleen eventually sues him for $1 million. Now, I don't know if she won the lawsuit, but she still sued. His second wife was an actress named Louise Lasser. They were married from 1966 to 1970. And this marriage was pretty scandalous because he was already cheating with Louise Lasser before he had divorced his uh, first wife, Harleen. Gossip also claims that Woody Allen was super duper possessive over Louise, even after they had divorced in 1970. It is claimed that it took her several several years to get from under his manipulation and his mind control. He basically had her keeping an open door for him. You know what I'm saying? He could kind of do what he wanted, but whenever he wanted to come and check in on her, the door was always open. And it took her forever to kind of shut that door to realize what was going on. And before we get to Woody's third wife, we have a lot of questionable activity that we have to talk about in between. Now in 1976, Woody Allen was sitting down in a restaurant 
restaurant when his eyes wandered over to a beautiful young lady. She and Woody locked eyes and this may have been the beginning to a wonderful great love story but there was one problem. This young lady was not really a lady at all. She was a teenager, 16 years old. Her name was Christina Engelhart and she was an actress. And per Christina, she actually spotted Woody first and she also approached Woody first. She said that at that meeting at the restaurant, she was the one that got up from her chair, got up and walked over to Woody's table and kind of just slid her number on the table and told him to call her. She claims that Woody Allen knew she was in high school and he knew that she was 16 and they started an intense love affair. And we're gonna get back to Christina Engelhart in just a second. Now let me tell you about 1977. And this was on the set of Woody Allen's movie, Annie Hall. There was a 16 year old actress there by the name of Stacey Nelkin and she only had a bit part in this movie. As a matter of fact, child, Stacey ain't had none for real, child. The uh, little part that she was in ended up on the cutting room floor. But although her acting bit didn't impress Woody Allen, Stacey Nelkin herself did impress Woody Allen. And by that next year, 1978, when Stacy was 17 years old, she and Woody started to date each other. Oh, and Woody was 40 when he started dating Christina Engelhart, and now that he's dating Stacy, he's 42. Well, Stacy and Woody's relationship also became sexual in nature and very passionate. In fact, the relationship was supposedly going so well that Woody started to write a movie about their lives together, and this movie was called Manhattan. And if you watch the movie Manhattan, it is indeed about a 42 year old divorced man who starts to date a 17 year old. And Woody himself plays the role of the divorced man. And this relationship would constitute as predatory since Stacy was underage. But whenever she is asked about it, even today, Stacy says that there's nothing predatory about it. She says that, hey, she wanted Woody and she got what she wanted. Says she was having a good time. She loved Woody and Woody loved her while it lasted and then when it was over it was just over but baby listen at this this is where it's finna get all kinds of crazy because even though Woody allegedly wrote this whole Manhattan movie for him and Stacey Nelkin, when shooting the movie of Manhattan, he fell in love with the actress that played the 17 year old love interest. So the actress that played Stacey Nelkin in the movie, Woody fell in love with that actress while they were shooting. And that's when he starts rubbing up on this actress. And this actress's name is Muriel Hemingway and she is actually 18 years old. Gossip claims that Woody was so infatuated with Marielle that either during the movie or after the movie had wrapped up, he actually flew to her family home and asked her to take a, a trip to Paris with him. And at first, Marielle's face lit up. You know what I'm saying? Paris, who doesn't want to go there? But as she and Woody are discussing things, he never mentions a separate room for her. And so Marielle starts to get uncomfortable. And so she starts to basically be like, you know, no, I don't think it's a good idea that I should go. You know, maybe I need to just stay here with my parents. But Woody is persistent, so persistent that Marielle ends up going into another room with her parents and asking them. After Marielle asked her parents, they were like, hmm, yeah, Paris, you know, it's really nice at this time. We think you should go. And so Marielle pretty much starts to drop hints to her parents that Woody is like not talking about separate rooms, that Woody is basically wanting her to go down there and start an affair with him. And per gossip, her parents understood everything that Marielle was trying to say and they still looked at each other and was like, mm, yeah, I really think that you should go with Woody. It's so wonderful for him to invite you. Luckily though, Marielle said no once and for all and so Woody ended up giving up asking her but still this man ended up staying all night at her family home that night and then that very next morning that's when he got on a private jet and flew out to uh, Paris. But honey child, listen to the messiness of it all honey because because gossip claims that Woody Allen got at least part of what he was looking for anyway. Because what he did is just write it into the movie script. Baby said part of the script, it was written for Marielle to kiss Woody's character. And I don't know if this was like a long passionate kiss or a peck on the lips or whatever it was. But gossip claims that after the kiss was filmed, Marielle ran over to the cinematographer in tears, begging and pleading, please don't make me do that again. Do I have to do that again? Child, listen, a hot mess. Now in 1979, Woody met actress Mia Farrow who started starring in his movie. And then in 1980, Mia and Woody started a relationship. And remember when I said we would get back to Christina Engelhart? 
Well, let's do that right now. Because from 1976 to right at this point, Woody Allen and Christina had never stopped messing with each other. So she is out for a run or out shopping or something like that, and she spots Woody and Mia. And so Christina's like, Woody, hey baby. Honey said Woody's eyes turned into slits. And he was like, hi Christina, let me introduce you to my girlfriend. And he pushed Mia Farrow kinda in front of him and was like, Mia, Mia Farrow, this is my girlfriend. Broke Christina's heart and all also let her know that she had just kind of been dragged along on a string. She was just kind of marching to Woody Allen's beat. Now, as far as Mia Farrow, just like all of the other women or shoot, teen girls that were in uh, Woody Allen's life, she fell head over heels for Woody Allen. Mia wanted a serious relationship with Woody Allen off the bat. She wanted a connection. She wanted them to be very, very in love. And gossip claims that Woody Allen was not treating this relationship the same way. But regardless of how he or Mia felt, Hollywood loved it. The public loved it. They became Hollywood's newest darling couple. Everybody was shipping the couples, like Brangelina, Benifer, heck, even Denzetta. And yes, that's Denzel Washington and Pauletta because they need some Hollywood nicknames too. So Denzetta is what it is, doggone it. But back to the story. Mia and Woody were this new Hollywood royalty type couple. But behind the scenes, nothing could have been further from the truth. Baby, Woody wouldn't even live in the same house as Mia Farrow. And supposedly Woody was okay with this, you know what I'm saying? Cause this is what he wanted, but Mia was not. You know, she really wanted a serious relationship. So much so that it's alleged that she started to pressure Woody to become like a stepfather to her children. You know what I'm saying? She wanted them to be a family unit. And just to let you know, Mia Farrow already had seven children when she came into this relationship with Woody Allen. She had three birth sons from her marriage to Andre Previn, and she also had adopted three Asian children while she was still married to Andre Previn. And then immediately after she divorced Andre Previn, she adopted a fourth child from Asia. And this last Asian child named Moses, he was adopted right after she left Andre Previn and right before she got with Woody Allen. So again, Mia Farrow comes into the relationship with these seven children. Gossip claims and when Mia finally realizes that Woody shows no interest in being a father to the seven children she already has, she starts to tell Woody, well, Woody, how about we adopt a child together? Word on the street says Woody told her no. Did not matter, Mia kept asking, and she kept trying to convince him that, you know, this will be our child. But what she didn't know is this whole our child thing was actually backfiring on her, because gossip claims that Woody told her, see, that's what I'm talking about. I don't wanna be tied in to take care of any child. Like, I don't want my name on any paperwork basically saying I'm responsible for any child. I don't want that. So finally, Mia says, okay, okay, let's just keep your name off of the adoption page. Papers. You know what I'm saying? Like, you won't be made to take care of this child at all if anything blows up. You know, let's just me and you know that this is our child, our uh, love child. And so, allegedly, after Mia makes this explanation, that is the first time that Woody finally shows any type of interest and gossip claims that what this man said is, mm, okay. Maybe I'll be a little bit more into it if you make sure, first of all, the child is blonde. And also, if the child is a female, you know, a blonde little girl, a beautiful blonde little girl, maybe I'll be more interested in us doing this whole adoption thing. So Mia says yes! It is time to celebrate, she is so happy. Oh my gosh, she gets started almost immediately searching for a little beautiful blonde girl that she can adopt so they can have this child. And then on July 11th, 1985, Mia Farrow adopted a little blonde headed girl who was only two weeks old. When she got this child into her possession, she named this little girl Dylan. To Mia's surprise, as well as probably other people's surprise, Woody Allen supposedly takes to this little girl almost instantly. He is holding her all the time. He is loving her all the time. She supposedly becomes daddy's little girl. Well, gossip claims that Mia is overjoyed that Woody is actually showing love and affection to this child. So everything seems cool. Little Dylan is growing. And then in 1987, Mia Farrow becomes pregnant. She ends up giving birth to a son who is named Satchel Farrow. And uh, later on, Satchel changes his name to Ronan Farrow. Now check me out because see, here comes a little bit more mess. Woody Allen was said to seem proud to call Ronan his son, but honey, 
The folks say that after some years had passed, that Woody Allen started to question if Ronan Farrow was his son at all. Because as Ronan Farrow became older and older, he started to look almost exactly like Mia Farrow's first husband, whom was Frank Sinatra. Now there is this theory going around and gossip claims that Woody Allen either now or at least one point in his life subscribed to this theory. And the theory is this, it is alleged that Mia Farrow wanted so badly to tie her and uh, Woody Allen together that even though he seemed like he was taking a liking to Dylan and he was starting to come around a lot more, Mia wanted something like a blood child to actually tie them together. She wanted this so much that she actually went back to Frank Sinatra and they messed around and she became pregnant. And of course, once she became pregnant, she was able to complete her plan of having Having this baby that was her and Woody's blood baby. Now again, Ronan was born in 1987 and in the next four years, Woody Allen was coming to the house more and more. You know, he was there to spend time with his son, Ronan. Also, he was growing a little bit closer to Moses, the child that Mia had adopted right before they got together. But per gossip, the main person that he was truly coming to see was the adopted daughter, Dylan. He and Dylan were said to have a very close, very intense relationship. In fact, it was so intense that when the youngest child, little Ronan, was signed up to see a psychologist and this psychologist's name was uh, Dr. Susan Coates. So Ronan was signed up to see the psychologist. It's alleged that Mia told the psychologist that she would like for her to speak to Woody as well because Mia did not like the way that Woody paid so much attention to Dylan while ignoring the other children, especially the older children that she had. Now, Woody actually came to this therapy session and Dr. Susan Coates claimed that she told Woody, hey, it is inappropriate how intense your relation is with Dylan. You know, you guys are too close. But Dr. Coates also made it clear to mention that she did not feel like the relationship was sexual in any way. Now, in response to this therapist, Woody Allen said at the time that the reason that he doted on Dylan the way that he did and showed her affection the way that he did is because Mia had basically pretty much abandoned the child ever since baby Satchel Ronan was born. And so he tried to make up for that by spending all of this time with Dylan. He also said that he was not able to spend any time with Ronan. And when the therapist, Dr. Dr. Susan Coates asked uh, Mia Farrell why this was the case, Mia said that she doesn't allow Woody to spend any time with her son Ronan because she feels like Woody is a bad influence and she would just feel a lot safer if Ronan was kept away from his father. Now, regardless of all of these therapy sessions and all of this just can't get right mess going on with this family, in 1991, Woody decided that he wanted to co-adopt Dylan as well as Moses. And rumor has it that Mia was absolutely ecstatic about this adoption because she felt like this would make them a real family. It really seemed like everything that she had been pushing so hard for was really starting to come to pass. Unfortunately for Mia though, there was something brewing that was about to turn this whole family dynamic upside down. Woody Allen's old habits or so-called old habits came back to bite this whole family in the behind with a vengeance. Now the year is 1992 and Mia is at Woody's house because again, these people do not live together. Now, sometime while she was over there, she ends up walking by his fireplace and something catches her eye. So Mia is like, oh, you low down cheating mother sucker. You sorry dog because what she sees is a picture of a naked woman. But as she picks up the pictures and truly look at them, she starts, you know, adjusting her eyes, just trying to make sure what she's seeing is right. And she can't even barely process what she's looking at because the pictures are of her 21 year old daughter that she adopted while she was still married to Andre Previn. This girl's name is Soon Yi Previn. So instantly Mia is like sick. You know, she's like, oh my gosh, is this man messing around with my daughter? Like, what do these pictures even mean? And so she calls Woody over and she asks him, what the heck is this? And Woody does not deny it. He admits that yes, he has been sleeping around with Soon Yi. He says it's only been happening for about a month. You know, it started in December of 1991, but now that Mia has found out, you know, he chooses Mia. You know, he wants to leave Soon Yi alone. It'll never happen again. So Mia lets it go. 
Not only does she let it go, she also continues to shoot a movie that she had been filming uh, for Woody Allen. And not only that, Woody continued to come over to her home and they tried to get on with life like nothing had ever happened. Well, are things ever just clipped with an ending like that? Of course not. And Woody Allen turned out to be a stone-faced liar. He had not stopped messing with Soon Yi, and he didn't ever intend to. As a matter of fact, he and Soon Yi were still doing so much and still talking so much that in July of 1992, Soon Yi had a job at a summer camp and she was fired because she spent all of her time on the phone with a so-called Mr. Simon. But this Mr. Simon turned out to be Woody Allen. Soon Yi was fired in July of 1992 for spending too much time talking to Woody Allen. By late August of 1992, Woody Allen's face was plastered all over the news and all over the media as a child molester. Not because he was accused of molesting Soon Yi Previn, but because he was being accused of molesting the younger adopted daughter, the one that he had the close bond with, Dylan. Now, how did this happen? Why did this happen? And most of all, is it true? Well, we are about to go into a full breakdown that will include rumors as well as facts to try to piece this thing together. We will also be using the supposed timeline that makes up this case. So try to pay attention. As a matter of fact, don't try. Do pay attention if you want to follow this and try to get to some sort of understanding at the end because whoop cha. It is a hot mess. Now, allegedly, a few days after Soon Yi lost her job for being caught on the phone with Woody Allen all the time, Woody Allen stopped by Mia Farrow's summer home in Connecticut to celebrate seven-year-old Dylan's birthday. Now, Dylan's actual birthday was on July the 11th, so this happened on or around July the 11th. Well, when Woody gets to the house to celebrate, he ends up going to a back bedroom, and when he gets back there, there is a note pinned on the door. Rumor has it this note said one or two things. The first thing it is claimed that the note said was just the words child molester. The other version says the note said child molester. You're doing to Dylan the same thing that you did to Soon Yi. I don't know exactly what happened between Woody and Mia right after this note was left, but clearly if that note really was left on the door, Woody had to know that uh, Mia had found out that he and Soon Yi were still seeing each other. What I do know is that on August the 1st of 1992, Dr. Susan Coates says that Mia Farrow called her frantic. She was crying and screaming on the phone and she was saying, Woody is still messing with Soon Yi. He's still dating Soon Yi. He told me he would leave her alone. And she was calling him the devil. She was calling him demonic. She really was just kind of saying all of her thoughts and kind of blubbering off at the mouth. Well, at one point in the conversation, Mia says, and then we just talked about getting married like two weeks ago. Should I still marry him? To which the therapist responded, are you serious? And per the therapist, when she responded that way, that's when Mia was like, oh, you know what? Yeah, you're right. He's dating my daughter. He is the devil. And then she started begging the therapist, please stop him. Please make him stop dating Soon Yi. To which the therapist replied to her that Mia or Miss Farrell, there's nothing that I can do. Soon Yi is above age. I can't do anything. Now, a quick side note here. Even though Soon Yi was above age when Woody got caught with her photos and he confessed, gossip claims that he probably was messing around with her ever since high school. Now, Woody says that he was not messing around with this child, you know, he waited till she was 21, but his past track record really showed that he really liked 17 to 18 year olds, you know what I mean? So, I don't know. On August the 4th, Mia Farrow takes a couple of her adopted children and she goes shopping with a friend. Once she leaves, the people who are still at the house are Dylan, her baby brother Ronan, her elder brother Moses, their babysitter Christy Grotecki, and I hope I said her name right, the children's French tutor Sophie Bird, Mia's friend's children, the friend that Mia went shopping with, that woman's children are in the house, and their babysitter, a woman named Allison Strickland, is also in the house with them. And again, those are the friend's kids' babysitter, okay? Allison Strickland is that their babysitter. Sometime, while all of these people are in the house on that day, Woody Allen stops by to visit Dylan, 
Moses, and Ronan, the three youngest children he had grown closer to, he stopped by to visit those children. I couldn't see exactly how long he stayed, but I'm guessing he stayed for like an hour or two and then he left. Mia Farrow comes home from her shopping and she goes to greet her children. She says that Dylan runs up to her with a dress with no underwear on. Now, Mia said that she felt like that was strange, but you know, Dylan is a seven-year-old kid. So Mia feels like, you know, maybe it's not a big deal. Well, the very next day on August the 5th, Mia Farrow receives a phone call. And this phone call comes from the friend that she went shopping with. This friend says that her babysitter, Allison Strickland, was like, hey, I need to talk to you. I saw something very disturbing when I was over at Mia's house. And she proceeds to tell Mia that what her babysitter saw was a Dylan sitting down on the couch like just sitting there and then Woody Allen was on his knees kneeling in front of this child with his head down in her lap so these are Dylan's thighs like she's sitting there uh, Woody is facing her forward and has his head down in her lap. Now, at the time it was reported, the first time that it was ever mentioned that Woody's head was down in this child's lap, it was said that Dylan had on clothes, okay? Back in 1992, it was said that Dylan had on clothes. However, since then, there is a second version of the story that is out that claims that Dylan had no clothes on, that she had, or at least no underwear on, that she just had her naked whatever in her legs and this man had his face down in her naked stuff as soon as mia gets off the phone with her friend and this babysitter she calls dylan into the room she asks dylan hi dylan did your dad put his uh head in your lap she claims that Dylan told her, yes, mommy, he did, and I didn't like that, mommy. After talking to Dylan and the babysitter, Mia Farrow calls her attorney and tells her attorney what Dylan has said. The attorney tells Mia, okay, well then take Dylan to the doctor to get her checked out. But before Mia took Dylan to the doctor, she called someone else psychologist Dr. Susan Coates and she called her and said hey I need to tell you something Dylan just told me that Woody has been doing uh, inappropriate things to her well obviously Dr. Susan Coates felt like something was wrong with this because after she got off the phone with Mia she sat and she thought about it for a day and then on the very next day on August the 6th Dr. Coates called Woody Allen to let him know what Mia was saying she called him to let him know the allegations well per gossip either on August the 5th when Mia got off the phone with calling everybody or on August the 6th she took Dylan to her regular normal pediatrician Dr. Kavarajan so Dr. Kavarajan looked this child over and he said that he did not see any signs of sexual molestation also Mia was telling him what Dylan said but when she was telling Dylan to tell him you know what happened Dylan would not say anything so the doctor pretty much concluded that day that nothing had gone on you know and he sent these people home well allegedly as soon as they got home Mia pulled out a video camera and she put it on Dylan and she told Dylan to tell her exactly what happened what had Woody done to her now rumor has it these tapes were filmed over a period of several days as a matter of fact it is claimed that there are 11 segments of this tape and then try to listen to this because some gossip claims that Mia Farrow like had this camera out on this child while this child was in the bathtub nude you know and also like at different times when the child had her shirt off just you know and I guess maybe she was trying to catch her at these times because while this child was supposedly nude Mia would ask her things like okay Dylan point to me exactly where show me how daddy did this to you you know did he rub you like that and all this kind of stuff and so this child was like showing her exactly what happened again gossip claims there were 11 segments of this tape however one of the most popular and the most shown segments is allegedly a time when Dylan was explaining what happened on the date of August the 4th and she said that Woody came and took her by the hand and that he felt her up on the behind then he took her up to the attic and he made her play with an electric train in the attic and laid her on her stomach while he assaulted her from behind once Dylan said this story on tape 
Mia set another doctor appointment and she took Dylan back to Dr. Kavarajan and she told Dylan to tell Dr. Kavarajan what she said on the tape. You know, Dylan, tell the doctor what you told me while I was recording you. Rumor has it, Dylan does repeat the story. She tells the doctor the exact same story that she says on the camera. Dr. Kavarajan, hearing this, performs an even deeper search for signs of sexual abuse. He did not find any signs of sexual abuse. However, when Mia and Dylan left the doctor's office, Dr. Kavarajan called the cops and reported that there may be some sexual abuse going on. And when he was asked, like, why would you do this if her own mother didn't call the police? The doctor said, like, that's his job. If somebody tells him a child is being abused, he's supposed to call the police. So you know how I told you that Woody Allen was informed on August the 6th, okay? Well, between August the 6th and August the 13th of 1992, there was some type of communication between Mia and Woody Allen. I'm not exactly sure what was said, but these two people had to have communicated because what people don't know is that on August the 13th, 1992, their two legal teams met up. And in this meeting, Mia's legal team demanded that Woody Allen would pay for her children's care. You know, her children's support, the schooling, anything that the children may need, they demanded that Woody Allen pay for that. They also demanded that Woody Allen would give Mia some money because since she was not going to be starring in his movies anymore, she was going to have a loss of income of about $300,000. Okay, so that subject is done. That is over with. Well, after that, there was another subject discussed. And per Woody Allen, this is when Mia's legal team, in particular, a lawyer with the last name of Dershowitz, came up and was like, hey, you know, really, all of this stuff can go away. Like, you don't have to be charged for anything. Nothing will ever make it out to the media. All you need to do is give Mia five to eight million dollars. So pretty much, hush money. Well, when Dershowitz was asked about this later on and when the trial and stuff was going on, he said that yes, they did uh, tell Woody that everything could be like just dropped. And he said it was because the betterment of the children. You know, he didn't want to hurt the children and the children probably would like go crazy to see their father put on trial, to see their father locked up. So in order to keep some semblance of normalcy, Mia's team could quietly contact the Connecticut Police Department and tell them, hey, just don't even investigate Woody Allen. You know, Mia don't want to press charges. Let's just leave it all alone. Nothing should be criminal. But they were doing that for the children. Dershowitz said that he felt like it would be better for the children as well as everybody else involved, including Woody himself. But he said that this couldn't be hush money though because he didn't ask for hush money while he was describing all of this to Woody. He didn't put any money in that sentence, you know. So he said the money stuff was a totally different issue. That was coming from caring for the kids. But see, I think they really made a fatal mistake when they did mention like hush money and all this children's care and all this kind of stuff because Woody Allen was like, I don't care if the public finds out or not. And apparently he felt like Mia was trying to use the kids against him or something. I don't know, child. All I know is that on August the 13th, the same day that these meetings were held, Woody went down and filed papers and he sued for full custody for Dylan, Moses, and Ronan. And when Woody went down there to file those papers, everything went haywire, honey, because this was public information. So when he did this, immediately the tabloids had a field day. I mean, they were printing everything. They were printing that Woody was trying to take the kids and they were printing that, ooh, the rumors about Woody and his adopted daughter, Soon Yi. And then the biggest one of all, ooh, what about these rumors where Mia Farrow is accusing Woody of molesting her child, Dylan? So everything just exploded and once again went haywire. But here's a little known thing that people don't know. Allegedly, almost immediately after Woody sued for custody, those tapes of Dylan, the one that that uh, Mia filmed those tapes. Copies of those tapes were sent anonymously to a local TV station in New York, WNYW TV. How could this happen? Who would have had their hands on the copies? You know, who stole copies of this tape and sent it to this uh, TV station? Baby, listen, I'ma say this and I'ma save it to the end to give my real spiel, but I'ma just say this, adult game. WNYW TV said that they considered airing this tape, but Mia's lawyer, as well as Woody's lawyer, got in touch with this uh, local TV station and basically, you know, told them not to air it. Like, they didn't want them to air it. And then on August 17th of 
1992, Woody Allen releases a public statement. And in this statement, he says, yes, he is dating Soon Yi. Yes, he is in love with Soon Yi. She's basically the love of his life and she's a wonderful woman. And then on August the 18th, Woody Allen holds a press conference and he talks about the molestation charges. And he says that these are ridiculous. You know, these are gruesome and grotesque. And this is just Mia. She's just upset that I'm with Soon Yi now. And so she's just manipulating this child and having this child deal and say these things against me. And then two days later on August 20th, it is announced that Woody Allen has taken a polygraph test, a lie detector test, and he has passed. But what most people don't know is that this is not a lie detector or polygraph test that is given by the Connecticut Police Department. This polygraph person was hired by Woody's private team. The polygraph tester was not just some Rudy Poo little guy, you know, they're working on the side office or nothing like that. This was a well-respected, world-renowned polygraph test giver. His name was Paul Miner. So then we come down to do you think that Woody Allen could have bribed this guy do you think that this guy would have took a bribe even though he was putting his reputation at risk and he had been doing this for years so what do you think do you think Woody Allen had enough money to flip this guy well while you think about Woody and decide how you feel about that gossip claims that Woody Allen also wanted Mia Farrow to take a lie detector test and she supposedly refused their lie detector test but she never did like take another one like she didn't hire anybody she just never took one. The very next day on August the 21st, Woody Allen did an interview with Time Magazine. And in this interview, he talked about his relationship with Soon Yi. He made it clear that when he first started messing with Soon Yi, she was already a 21 year old woman. And he said that uh, he just expected her to be his side chick. He never meant for the relationship to go public. But when asked, like, how would he mess with his girlfriend's adopted daughter? Woody Allen did not care. He did not give a rat's tail. He felt like like, okay, so, you know, so what? She's Mia's daughter. She's not my daughter. And then he got upset because he's like, I'm tired of people saying that she was my adopted daughter. She was not my adopted daughter. This child was adopted when Mia was married to Andre Previn. That's their child that they raised together. But yet and still, Mia and Woody were together for about 11 to 12 years before all of this stuff blew up. So that would mean that Woody Allen was in Soon Yi's uh, life for like 11 to 12 years, right? Well, according to Woody Allen as well as Soon Yi, that was not the case because Woody Allen never truly lived with Mia Farrow. Allegedly, they paint him as somebody who was Mia's boyfriend, like as far as Soon Yi, she feels like he was mom's boyfriend. He would drop over every once in a while, you know, and he would speak to us kids but he never just dived in and raised us. He was never like just a hands-on stepfather. That's what Woody and Soon Yi claim. But like I said, on August the 21st, Woody does this interview. The public goes in an uproar because this man has no morals. You know, they don't understand just how can he not think this is wrong that he messed around with his girlfriend's adopted daughter. Well, for the rest of 1992, there's this big, huge back and forth, you know what I mean? Between Mia Farrow, Woody Allen, and the freaking public, honey, because baby, you you know the public got to put their two cents in it. Well, while this is happening, um, the Connecticut Police Department set to work trying to build a criminal trial against Woody Allen. And they enlist the help of the Yale New Haven Hospital team, said to be made up of pediatricians, psychiatrists, psychologists, to start doing interviews with Dylan. And sometime during these interviews, they gave Dylan two dolls, a male doll and a female doll. And these dolls were anatomically correct. So, you know, they had their correct parts private parts and so Dylan was playing with these dolls and then she takes the male private parts and she inserts it into the female private parts and so they're asking her uh Dylan how do you know this and she says because in the summertime me and my little brother Ronan saw daddy doing this with Soon Yi well baby let me tell you how much it seems like nobody gives a dog gone about these kids in this doggone case because instead of it becoming a huge deal that this child Dylan is saying that her and her baby brother sat there and watched while Woody did this to their sister do you know what instead becomes a big deal trying to figure out what summer it was honey they need to know if it was summer 1991 
Island, a summer 1992. And do you know why that's significant? Because Soon Yi's birthday was in October. And that would mean if the kids saw this on summer 1991, that Soon Yi would have been 20 years old instead of 21 years old. Remember I told you that Woody said, oh, we started doing this in December of 1991. Mia's team allegedly wants to assume that this child is talking about summer 1991. Because Mia's team once again wants to prove that Soon Yi was not 21 yet. In the end, a judicial investigation proves that Woody Allen did indeed start messing with Soon Yi in December of 1991, making her 21 years old. But baby, who gives a doggone? I don't give a doggone if Soon Yi was 31 years old. Why is that what you guys were focused on? Did anybody just hear this child say that her and her little brother, like, watch this? Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, these folks made me mad. I ain't gonna lie. I, I got mad during this. So now we are finally at 1993. And so the custody trial where Woody had sued for custody, that starts in March of 1993. Well, of course, now you're talking about a custody trial, but this man has been accused of molestation for one of these children he's trying to get custody of. So, of course, that is like the meat of this case. Woody takes the stand and he testifies that he has not done anything to Dylan or any other child. He says that Mia is a scorned, heartbroken woman and she's just making all of this stuff up. They also heard testimony from babysitter Christy Grotecki. This was Mia's own babysitter. And Christy Grotecki said that on the day of August the 4th, she lost sight of Dylan and uh, Woody for 15 to 20 minutes. And she did not say this, but of course them going missing for 15 to 20 minutes is insinuating that Woody took a uh, Dylan up to the attic and did those things. And then French tutor Sophie Burge got on the stand and she said that she noticed that Dylan was not wearing any underwear under her dress that day. But then you have the other nanny, Monica Thompson. Now Monica Thompson was not even in the house on the day of August the 4th. She was not there. However, in a sworn affidavit, she said that she and others had been pressured by Mia Farrow or had felt pressured to testify in favor of Mia Farrow. She also said that she had a conversation with Christy Grotecki and Christy Grotecki admitted to her, as per court records, that she really had not lost sight of Dylan for more than five minutes. Monica also said that Christy also told her that she did not remember Dylan ever going around without underwear. Now, when Christy was brought back in to answer this, you know, make sense of this, Christy admitted that she did indeed have these conversations with Monica but she said that she never said anything about the underwear thing. She said that that's a lie. But she admitted that she did indeed tell Monica Thompson that she didn't remember ever losing sight of the child. Like, you know, she didn't remember ever uh, losing sight of Dylan at all that day. And Monica Thompson ended her affidavit by saying that she felt that these charges against Woody Allen were not true. And then towards the end of the trial came Dr. John Leventhal from the Yale New Haven Hospital team. Dr. John Leventhal said that he and his team did not see any evidence where Woody assaulted this child. They could not tell if this child had made all of this stuff up on her own or if Mia had coached her to do this or if it was both of them mixed together. Well, that right there should have pretty much been the end of everything, right? Well, not really, because the Yale New Haven Hospital team destroyed the notes. While they were doing all of this research and uh, making this report, they destroyed the notes that showed how they got to the conclusion that they got to. Whatever the case, like I said, in the final report, they said that Woody Allen was innocent. Well, remember, this was the Connecticut Police Department who had hired the Yale New Haven Hospital team. So, Mia Farrow, as well as Woody Allen, were allowed to uh, hire their own own experts to like look over the report to see you know what all happened to make sure everything was done legit. Woody Allen's expert that he hired Ann Meltzer who was a forensic psychologist she got on the stand and she said that you know everything looked good to her you know what I'm saying the report was cool she agreed with it. Mia's expert that she hired Stephen Herman a child psychiatrist said that the report was uh, severely flawed. He said that he did not see anything anywhere that would have showed that this child would have made up all of this stuff in her head. However, he also said that he did not see anywhere where this report could have concluded that uh, Woody was guilty of molesting this child. And honey, you know that Mia Farrow was back looking like how she looked on Rosemary's Baby because baby, you know all her hair had fell out because this was the expert she hired. And then if I was Mia, I would have straight fell out on the next thing that Steven said because baby, Steven got up there and said, 
naturally looks like to him the way that the questions were asked to the child in like emotional ways he said that that would kind of prompt the child to answer in the way that the person behind the camera wanted the child to answer let me remind you again this is mia's hired expert what the heck, sir? Now, I'm not sure if Woody Allen tried to pull strings at this trial or not. I'm not sure if this man was paying folks behind the scenes and all this kind of stuff, but it is pretty clear that the judge thought so. Because in June of 1993, he rejected Woody Allen's bid for custody of the children. He also said that Woody's uh, visitation with Dylan needed to stop immediately, at least for six months. He said he felt like uh, Woody had been grossly inappropriate with Dylan. And while it was not really sexual in nature, he had to admit to that. He said that still it was inappropriate to him. And he said that one thing that he really did not like is the way that Woody Allen tried to paint Mia Farrow as a crazy scorned woman. He made Woody Allen pay the court cost and by all means Mia Farrow was victorious in this custody case. But now you get to the criminal case. And just to sum it up, there was no criminal case because the forensic specialist chief of Connecticut's state crime laboratory, Dr. Henry Lee, said police had found something in the crawl space. But he said that those were just hair fibers and he said that they did not connect to Woody Allen at all. And the Connecticut state attorney Frank Mako wanted so badly to put Woody Allen in jail. He held a press conference and said that he had probable calls and even though it seemed like Woody Allen had done this thing really without the shadow of doubt that Woody Allen was guilty, he was not going to press charges. And he said the reason why is because he did not want to put Dylan through further trauma. But anybody in law enforcement knew automatically that that was a lie. The reason that he did not try to lock Woody Allen up or go to trial was because he did not have the evidence. Now that is pretty much the meat of this whole issue between uh, Mia Farrow and Woody Allen. Since then, both sides have done little picking and nitpicking back and forth. And I'm not gonna cover all of that, but I will uh, cover some notable things that happened. First of all, let's talk about one of the main people in this whole thing, Soon Yi. From 1992 and even up until today, Soon Yi has made several different quotes and basically in these quotes, she said that Woody Allen was never a stepfather to her. She also says that while she was growing up that Mia Farrow abused her and beat her. And she also said that not only was Mia beating her, she was beating the rest of the children in the house, especially the adopted children. And then in 2013, Dylan went Went forward as an adult and she confirmed that her father did indeed molest her that he did do these nasty bad inappropriate things to her and that she was still struggling with it as an adult and then in 2018 Moses Farrell came out as an adult and the reason I say as an adult because when Moses Farrell was a kid he was supporting Mia and Dylan well now as a grown man in 2018 he said that he the younger him was a freaking liar and he said his mama Mia was a liar and Dylan he said she May not be lying but he said he feels like that she has false memories implanted in her head he also said that his mother mia farrow used to beat on him and one of the main things he was saying was that mia farrow treated her biological children better than her adopted children in fact uh moses said that the foreign children that she adopted mia adopted them to be servants around the house like he said that these they were maids you know what i'm saying in service like they had to serve her as well as the white children and then he comes with a major blow against Mia Farrow because he said that the attic that the electric train was supposedly in he said that there was no way for an electric train to be in that attic because it simply was not enough space as a matter of fact he said the attic was an un finished area. He said that it had no walls. The walls were fiberglass insulation. He also said that it was not a regular floor in the attic. It was like the wood floor with the exposed nails sticking up. He said that it was uh, mouse traps everywhere. He said that the roof of the attic or the ceiling of the attic was a steeple shape. And he said it was so steep that there was no way. Like it was just very small. It was the size of a crawl space. And then Moses went further to say, golly Moses, he said that Mia drove some of her other children to suicide. And he said all of the suicide children were foreign. Now, after Moses went absolutely in, honey, uh, Ronan ended up releasing a statement. And he says, like, you know, I don't know what my brother is talking about. Don't really care. I support my sister. I support Dylan. But regardless of what Ronan was saying, a lot of people felt like their eyes were open because of what Moses said. That is until... 
2021. Baby, in 2021, HBO released this documentary called Allen vs. Pharaoh, and it showed all kind of mess, honey. In 1992, Mia Farrow had a lot of conversations with Woody Allen and she recorded these conversations. And so the audience were able to hear how Woody Allen would respond to this lady very coldly. You know, allegedly on one phone call, Mia was on the phone saying, you know, Dylan is crying and she's holding her privates and she's saying that you hurt her. You hurt her, Woody, how could you do this? And said Woody would respond very coldly like, I didn't do this, I did not do this. I don't care what the child is doing, I didn't do this. And then at one point it's claimed that uh, Mia asked Woody, you know, like, how could you deny this? And said that Woody was like, you'll see. And then it showed those videos where Dylan was being uh, interviewed when she was seven years old. It showed those videos and it was harrowing footage of this child describing what happened to her, you know, and it made people sick to their stomachs and it made their skin crawl to hear this child uh, describe in detail what had happened to her. And then it showed Dylan, even in her adult years, talking about the abuse. And she started adding in other details that people had never heard before and how she used to just feel sick whenever he came around. She hated him, but she felt like she couldn't express the way she felt because he would get upset with her. Like she wasn't allowed to say, no daddy, I don't want you because Woody would treat her badly. And then there were talks about the times that Woody would make Dylan suck his thumb and he would like tell the child how to position her tongue and her mouth and like make this child suck his thumb. And it was discussed that how like three, four, five years old, all of these ages that Dylan would be laying in the bed with uh, Woody Allen and they both only had their underwear on and it was just a lot of messed up stuff and I can't even describe it all you guys have just got to watch it so there's this very compelling documentary right and then right after the documentary drops all of a sudden there are all of these articles that are critiquing the documentary one of the first critiques that these uh, articles suggest is why do they only hear half of the phone calls because the calls were just kind of like snip but not really playing the call in full then they wanted to know why come nobody who had had Woody's side was ever interviewed for this uh, documentary then they said why did Mia say in the uh, documentary that Woody and Dylan were together in bed with their clothes off in undies on but when she was on the stand at the trial she said that she had never seen them together with their clothes off and then they said if this child Dylan had been exhibiting behavior of a child that had been abused you know what I'm saying if this child had said that her stomach hurt every time that Woody came around and every time Woody came around she stopped talking and she kind of just fell over you know if she was exhibiting this stuff and if Mia did catch Woody trying to make this child suck his thumb especially if she caught this on more than one occasion then why would she continue to let Woody come over. And then the articles made the most compelling argument yet. If Dylan was once again showing all of these signs, and she was showing these signs very intensely at the age of five years old, then why in 1991, when Dylan was six years old, did Mia allow Woody Allen to co-adopt this child along with Moses? Not only did Mia allow the co-adoption, she wrote a glowing letter of recommendation and handed it to the judge. And basically the letter said that Woody Allen was going to be a great father for Dylan. So this is why I don't like the Woody Allen case. And this is nothing against uh, you, LaToya, for uh, requesting this. It's nothing against you. It's just that if it had not been requested, I would have never done this because I'm not gonna lie, this is a case that really makes me upset. Because for one, it's been going on for years. So it's like a tug of war type case. As soon as one side comes with compelling evidence and makes a grand statement, here comes the other side coming with their own uh, compelling evidence and making a grand statement. So it really just turns into this never ending cycle. I personally, me myself, honestly feel like Dylan should take Woody Allen to civil court. If you cannot get these people to arrest this man, the least he needs to be doing is paying a whole bunch of millions out of his pockets, you know, for doing this to her. And do I believe he did something to her? Yes, I do. I believe something happened. I'm not sure how deep or how far it went, but I do believe that some very strange things, strange and negative and bad things were going on with these children in this household, not just Dylan, all of these children in this household. Yes, I do absolutely believe that it was some very strange stuff going on. And that's what brings me to my last spiel and one of the biggest reasons why this story makes me mad, because it's like a whole bunch of innocent children suffered because of the games that a adults 
play. Because I'm going to tell you something, and this is just my opinion, but I believe that Mia Farrow is just as guilty as uh, Woody Allen. And the reason that I say that is because if Woody Allen was doing all this stuff, even if he did, I do not think that any one of us would have ever found out had Mia Farrow been able to keep Woody as her own man. If she was able to keep Woody in her grasp and that was her man, I do not believe for one second that we would have found out about any of this stuff. And that's my true feeling. And so that's why I keep saying children being made to play adult games. But anyways, y'all, I am done with this old Hollywood scandalous tale. I already know that it's probably going to be some kind of arguments and disagreements and opinions in the uh, comment section. And that's fine. But try not to kill each other, y'all, please. Oh, my gosh. But anyways, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm out. Um, go ahead. And if you enjoyed this video, click the like button, subscribe. And um, I will see you on the next video. Bye.